Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions in San Dimas, California. And today we're going to tackle the class 4 composite. This has got to be one of dentistry's most challenging aesthetic situations. So let's get started. I've got my iPad here and I'm going to show you what a class 4 prep would look like from the proximal view showing bevels both on the facial and lingual. And I'm going to draw in here a lingual segment of composite that we're going to fabricate utilizing a preoperative stent. This is going to be filled with a translucent composite material. The next area that we're going to want to build up when we're doing the class 4 is this middle section and we're going to have this middle section lay over the bevel just a little bit. That's important so that you can minimize the transition between one zone and another. And we're going to do this in an A2 dentin. And it can be any dentin shade you want. Usually dentin shades are significantly more opaque than enamel shades and that's a, a great advantage for us. We're then going to lay on top of that an area of enamel and that'll fill in between the lobes that we lay down with the dentin. And this particular area will be either an A2 or an A1, dent, A1 enamel. We're going to utilize here an A1 enamel, at least that's our plan. And you notice that there's this little notch down at the incisal area. And the reason for that is to create a little bit of a halo effect. This is an area on top that we're laying down which will be translucent. If all goes well, this should work quite well for us. So that's typically translucent. So you see that this is really a simplified version of a much more complicated design where we would use opaquers and stains and more maverick shades in the buildup of this class 4. But I'm going to keep it really simple today and I'm going to see if we can pull this off with just a few shades of composite. So wish me luck. So what I did was I took some extracted teeth and I put them in my Typodon and I simulated a fracture, a, a significant chip of a tooth like a, an injury, some traumatic fracture of a tooth. And we're going to use this as our starting point. So what I'm going to do first is utilize a 6888 burr, which is quite coarse. It's 125 micron grit. And we're going to lay over the fractured area. Whatever that fractured area is, there's really no need to remove a lot of tooth structure because the injury kind of did it for you. But we're going to create a bevel that is going to be at a very minimum the thickness of the enamel. And more than a millimeter wide, probably more like a millimeter and a half, maybe two millimeters wide or even wider. So if you make this really long bevel kind of going across that facial, you can really hide the composite and not have that horrible white line that we sometimes see or too much of an obvious transition. I'm now going to starburst this. It's a, it's a way to sort of put an irregular bevel on top of the bevel and it's going to look like a star burst and you're going to shoot this across the tooth just a little bit and this will help out with the transition. Now before I started I went ahead and made a, a stent and this would be normally made off of a diagnostic wax up of your class 4 fracture. If you have time you can quickly pour it up and do a quick wax up or have a laboratory help you with this, but I went ahead and made one and I utilize a very accurate material so that it fits intimately. I think a lot of people make these a little bit too quickly with not a lot of concern for accuracy. It's really important. The more accurate you are, the better your morphology will be on the lingual. So today we're going to use Harmonize by Kerr and it's really kind of a simple system. They, they just have these enamel shades and dentin shades and then they have a, a translucent shade. I am going to challenge myself to not use 12 or 15 different shades of composite and tints and opaquers because for a lot of people that's just not practical. 
These are the PTFD tapes or the Teflon tapes that we're used to using. This one here is your typical. It's very thin, but the problem with this tape is it crinkles over on itself quite a bit. And it gets a little bit messy and can kind of stick into your composite if you're leaving this in place while you're placing your composite. A thicker tape is the gas line tape. Now you can pick this up in the same section of the store or maybe you'd have to go to the section where they have the plumbing for gas lines and find this thicker tape. And what I really like about this particular tape instead of the white tape which is used for water lines is that you can crinkle this up and it still lays out really flat for you. So it's, it's quite thin and it can be stretched quite a bit, but it's less likely to crumple over on, your, on itself. So take a look here, I can kind of rub on it and it maintains its shape. Now for utilizing the typical Teflon paper water lines and you rub on it, you see how it kind of folds over on itself and it can be a real mess. So I like using that particular uh, yellow tape. Let's test the shades. I don't always do this because, you know, once the rubber dam's on, the tooth is drying out. So it becomes a little bit irrelevant uh, what shade you're going to choose based on trying it, trying it this way. It's usually just better just to pick your shade and go, go with what you see uh, and not worry about the fact that the tooth is dehydrating. So we can just take a look at this, cure it on the tooth, and get an idea what it's going to look like. Because remember that hybrid composites when you cure them are always going to shift in their value. They're never going to be the same value they were coming out of the tube. So when you lay it down, you can kind of get this idea that, uh-oh, this is the wrong shade. And then after you light cure it, you find a completely different situation. And you can see that shade change before and after curing. It's really obvious. I'm also going to go ahead and try a translucent on here just to see how that looks. Translucents, uh, it seems like they would be the most wonderful things you could use, but a lot of times translucents are going to create a lot of graying of the composites. You have to be really careful about how you use translucents. We are going to use a translucent on the lingual simply because I like the translucent on the lingual because you're going to have translucent interproximal, and if you used opaque, you would not have any flexibility there. So here we are just uh, putting acid etch over everything. We really like to extend the composite way beyond the bevel so that if there's any flash of composite, we're not going to have any white lines. This is our, we're going to use our adhesive system. I just happen to be using a one-step adhesive system, basically a universal system. And we're going to blow that thin. Boy, look at all the texture on that tooth. Isn't that amazing? We're going to blow it thin, we're going to do our light curing, we're going to light cure from the facial, light cure from the lingual as we always do, and then we're going to take this little jig we have, this preoperative stent, we're going to fill it with our translucent and adapt it really well, and we're going to thin it out. So it's really critical that we keep this nice and thin so that we don't have to modify it once we attach it to tooth structure. I like to place it in the jig and then attach it to the tooth. I'd rather do it this way than put material on the tooth and try to smash the jig into it or try to place the jig on the tooth and then place the composite into that little crack there. I typically get voids. But by placing the composite material in the jig first and carrying that onto the tooth, it's amazing how well it adapts. It's really kind of just incredible how much better this is than having the jig in place and trying to pack the composite in there where you end up getting a void on the lingual side so much of the time. So you see why we're using translucent so that we have translucent incisal and we also have translucent interproximal because we can always make something opaque but we can never take something opaque and make it translucent. So it's always good to use translucent on your lingual. All right. So now this is in place, and you can see how nicely it replicated that lingual anatomy. Boy, that would have been really hard to do freehand. All right, so here we are utilizing a, a dentin shade. This is your A2 a dentin. And I'm going to sculpt this a little bit so that it, it has more than just a single dimension to it. I want to create these sort of lobes underneath the surface. And, um, and remember that when you place this, you're going to want to make sure that it's under contoured significantly so that you can add subsequent layers above it. So just kind of tuck it in a little bit, make it like this little corner there that's below the outer contour of the tooth, 
and in you know spend enough time to wipe off the excess keep the light the operatory light away from the field so that you have extended amount of time if you're wearing loops with lights on them make sure you're using the orange filter over the front of it so that you can have a little bit more time to play with this and once you create sort of this you know variable morphology this internal structure then you can go ahead and cure that and I usually try to cure from lingual side first then follow up from the facial so now we have this substructure now that's under contoured significantly and now we're going to add to this with presumably we're going to use our enamel shade so we're going to lay down this an A1 enamel and this is like I said this is a very simplified approach and you notice I'm not using any Teflon tape I'm just going to place the uh, composite right up against the adjacent tooth which has not been etched which has not been treated with any bonding material so we'll be able to s just make a little kind of a cracking move with a little bit of an instrument to separate those two and get a strip between there very easily and here's this little in, in, in this indentation this little channel and maybe we're going to create some little uh, little variable sort of depressions that create this effect of maybe um, a translucency on the incisal so uh, and I'm doing this with just a few shades of composite so I, I'm, my expectations are not very high but I'm doing uh, as much as I uh, I can with the materials that we're using so now we've got the enamel in place so now it's, it's ready for translucent you would think now the problem today was that the translucent was just too translucent or maybe what I could say is that the enamel shade underneath was very translucent and very translucent means very gray and I think that we get so concerned about using translucent shades when in fact the real issue is the lack of opacity so I'm aborting this I am not going to use that I'm going to go to a dentin shade you can pick up an opaque composite a lot of companies have opaque shades and I think that uh, they can rescue situations like this where you're midway through and you're you're thinking oh my goodness this is not turning out well so uh, I want you to remember that it's opacity that is your friend and not translucency translucency is really a necessary aspect of composites but it is very challenging to just use translucent composite materials and make a realistic looking class 4 restoration Remember, translucents allow the light through. When they allow the light through, the darkness of the oral cavity shines through the front of that composite, and everybody sees that you've got this gray composite. So I would much rather have this opacity. I also notice this in class 5 composites. When we try to use translucents, thinking that we're going to create this lifelike appearance, we end up kind of looking at this gray composite and wondering, what did I do wrong? And I think it's just a matter of understanding that it's the, the, the opacity that is going to really give you what you want in most of these situations. So um, I boarded that and I switched over to this opaque, more opaque composite. And you can look at it from the incisal view. I think this is going to be the the reality check view for all of us on class fours is this this incisal view because that's where you can really determine if your line angles on that mesial are correct or not. Yes, we can get our length from the facial, and we can get our overall basic contours and texture and things like that, but getting that, that mesial facial line angle correct really requires us to look at this from the occlusal view. Look at that incisal view. Uh, I don't mind utilizing a little micro brush to smooth things out. I also use um, camel hair brushes and uh, uh, even sometimes rubber tips and things like that to manipulate the composite. Today I'm just showing you a very simple approach. I think that this is acceptable. It's not that great, but it doesn't have any texture yet. So after we polish this, or let's just say after we contour this with the Opti Discs here, and I'm starting with the coarse, and I'm going to do as much as I can with the coarse, and then I'm going to move on to the medium. And uh, I like to spin the disc in the direction from composite to tooth. Just like when we're finishing an amalgam or finishing gold, we always go from material to tooth. And I like to do that with air spray and also, also sometimes uh, water spray so we keep the tooth nice and cool and we flush away all the excess. So I'm just working my way through the discs and we're now on to this uh, medium disc. And then we're going to move into the fine and then the uh, extra fine discs. 
of this OptiDesk system and they come in this larger diameter and they also come in a smaller diameter. So you can utilize this to level out the incisal edge uh, and get those uh, corners right with the incisal edges, the distal corner and the mesial corner and it works really well uh, to step back away from the patient just a little bit, stand up, look at them straight on and see if you are getting this incisal length uh, proper. So now we've moved on to the the disc which is definitely finer. This is the um, the fine disc and then we're going to end up going to the extra fine here in just a second. Uh, one of the things that the discs should be doing is moving at all times. Don't let the disc just stay stationary. Uh, keep it moving as much as you can so that you don't create flat spots or sharp edges. You want to just kind of keep it moving over the surface the whole time like you're buffing a car or something like that. And now you can see how the, even though the shade is not ideal, uh, the, the contours are looking a lot better. And when the contours look good and you get the texture a little bit improved, you can usually get away with uh, a simple composite sequence like we did here today. And a lot of work is done on that corner right there so that we get that embrasure a little bit more leveled out. Now there's some problems here. I have a little over contour there on the mesial. We're going to have to remove that. And there's a little bit of work to do still on that embrasure on the facial. There's a little over contour. See that over contour right there? I'm going to bring that back just a little bit. So there's some things still to work on. But this is what you can do while the disc is fine. And you can run it across the surface lightly kind of skimming across, creating those, those contour changes that you need to have. And you know these discs come in two different diameters, so I'm using a large diameter, but you can also use the smaller diameter disc if you need to to get into these uh, hard to reach areas. I then follow that up with uh, the Ultradent Jiffy system. It's just a nice all-around polishing system. We can use this on the Lingual as well. There's It's a three-step process. And then follow that up with this product by Brassler called the Diacomp Featherlight and they have a, it's a two-step process as well. I'm just showing you the final step here. And these are great because they get into all the little uh, details of the surface and give you a nice finish. But the problem with this composite is just too flat. And you know what I'm talking about. We can polish the heck out of things and make them look incredibly f polished, but it doesn't have the texture that teeth have. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to create some texture in this tooth that will make it look a little bit more realistic. So now we've got this texture-free composite and we're going to use, I like, a coarse diamond with the biggest grit you can find and just run lightly across the tooth to try to replicate those pericamata in there and create a little bit of texture. You can also use a carbide bird and maybe create some of the little surfaces that the vertical lines as well. A uh, disc can be used sometimes to create little effects along there as well if you'd like to. But these little texture additions are the kinds of things that ceramists do with the crowns that we love so much. Why not do them in our composite? So now we go back to the feather light and we're going to run that over the surface and it will leave the texture that we created in place. If there's a little too much texture, not a problem. Just go back to the Jiffy Cup and take out some of the texture and get it the way you want it. But you can see now how your, your eyes are more interested in the texture than they are in maybe the fact that we don't have an optimal shade. So getting this to match perfectly is really, really difficult. However, I think we did okay. We have pretty good lingual contours and a decent final result from the facial. We can always do better. Well, thanks for spending a few minutes with me watching this video. I hope it does help out and give me comments and feedback. Uh, take care. Thanks.